Welcome to the Encore today. We're in a sort of a John series, Pastor yeah. Wes. Yeah. You know, you kind of, I don't know if sidetracked is the right word to say, but it's a, a little offshoot, I guess we can say, from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And today we're going to talk about something that has been asked. How many times in your in your ministry have you heard the question, hey, what's the unpardonable what's sin? What's the unpardonable sin? I, countless. Yeah, yeah countless, we, get it, we get it a countless, lot. Countless, countless. So it was definitely worth, I think, taking a week to... To dive into it, to explain it, I think so. Yeah, I know it's you know there are things that are just awkward in the Bible that I think people think are to be avoided or we just cannot understand it, and I didn't want right. that to be the case. Okay, all right. I have a weird question for you today. Oh, that's not a question. I'm gonna have you explain this. You talked about you once called <laughs> called it a superpower that I had to pull songs or something. Dude, right? I'm telling you, it's it is it is a superpower. And I've known this for a while, but you know what your superpower is? <laughs> I do not. I have no. <laughs> you're in your head. You're thinking, I got ten, buddy. What are no, you talking about? I have about? no idea what you're going to say. You have the button. You have the sleep button. Yes, I do. Yep, you're right. This is a you fascinating, bring this up as well, fascinating huh? thing. Yeah, that's true. So I, I am the opposite of a sleep button, meaning I cannot fall asleep in a car, in a plane. Like I have to be on my bed, horizontal. Or I'm wide awake. At bedtime. At, at bedtime. Like you can't Zero go naps. in there you know, on a Saturday at 2 p.m., right? No, it can't, it can't happen. So <laughs> well, what's fascinating about this is you have a button where you're like, it's just nap time. No matter where you're at, you can make it happen and fall asleep. That's right. And it also doesn't affect your sleep at night. No, is this true? No, no yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my heavens. Now, what's the negative side of this thing? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So first of all, I I want to tell you, it un- I've known this about you that you can't do this, and it annoys me about you, honestly, because it's so easy. Because you're like, oh man, I'm just so tired or whatever. I know. And in my mind, I'm like, well, go to sleep, like go take a nap, <laughs> like or or on an airplane or something. Can't like, do oh, it, dude. I'm exhausted. From like, how are you exhausted? I, I've been sleeping for two hours. Like, why are you? It just- annoys. So like, in you're my annoyed mind, with me. Because you only live in your own reality. Uh-huh. In my mind, everyone, if they wanted to go to sleep, could go to sleep. It doesn't occur to me that there are people You realize that, that people like me are annoyed at you. I'm looking at the plane going, what are you doing? And I will admit that I hear more from your side that, than can okay. relate to me. I hear more people that say talk like you talk just in life in general. They wish they could sleep better and they can't, where I don't understand what that means. Um, the downside is, I guess... I have to like get a decent. I have to sleep a lot to okay. function. Oh yeah, and I wish. in there are people that have, I guess, the other superpower of they need very little sleep and they can function at a high level, and their mind doesn't get foggy. They don't get headaches. They don't. They're not vulnerable to sickness in the same way. Yeah, yeah. So I do a lot. Like I live. You know, if you want to talk about whatever, uh, you know traveling for the ministry or switching time zones crossing the ocean mm-hmm. you know do like I, we go fast like preaching mm-hmm. multiple times you know in a weekend i'm not i'm not doing this to like make myself no, awesome i'm just saying running at the pace we would be beneficial if i didn't have to sleep so i have to find time to keep that going to put get, I get it, so yeah. i sleep in vans on the on the way to the airport i sleep in airports on airplanes i take naps you know, after church on Sunday for two hours, I, I can't function. So, but when you but when you wake up in the, let's either one when you wake up in the morning or wake up in the nap from a nap, you're train wrecked most of the time, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I wake up pretty rocked every day. Like so, the like, negative wow. side. You have the sleep button. You need the wake up button. Yeah. Or you could be yeah. like, let's just get going and move. Like I'm you, telling you, it's a long. It's a long <laughs> ramp to get out of sleep for me. Mm-hmm. Like I wake up on a plane, like I've been I've been awakened to the the plane hitting the ground, like to where I've been so asleep, sound asleep that I didn't hear any of the announcements, any of the table tray tables, all this beeping bells, mm-hmm. and and I, I literally pow, and I hear the reverse thrusters on the jet, you know, like slowing the plane down. On the I'm like, oh my gosh, I, how long have I been sleeping? But then I can't like snap out of it like it takes me 15 yeah. minutes like i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> man i was on a plane to zambia and with layovers and travel yeah. and everything yeah. a legitimate i'm not exaggerating 38 hours 38 yeah. hours oh, yeah. yeah i slept it's, it's grueling it's none it's like torture 
Well, unless None. you're unless you're sleeping twelve hours. Yeah, so it's, yeah, so <laughs> what do you know about torture? Not a lot. Not, not, I just people tell me it's really bad. Once I wake <laughs> up, and then they they tell me how bad it was. Yeah, thirty eight hours, and you didn't sleep. I, see, I don't understand no. how it's possible. No, I'm not saying you're nap. You need to be nap guy, but like, how can you not go to sleep on a plane after all that time? Like, I don't, it's just I don't a know. miserable, it's, tiring experience. Well, planes are some of the most uncomfortable yeah. places in the world. Yeah, I'm not going to argue that. Yeah, there's just I don't know. I'm I'm a light sleeper. That's a big that's a big part of it. So little noises. Even on a good night's sleep, I wake up seven, eight times, just roll over and go right back to sleep. But I can remember that. Last night I can remember well, I rolled over, moved my pillow, you huh. know, adjusted my covers. I, I do that seven, ten times a night. So little things just seem to wake me up. Would you feel rested in the morning? Yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. That's funny because I, I mean, I do once I like get myself, but I have to like I have to get up, so I don't get up on the brink of going to work. Uh-huh. I have to get up way earlier uh-huh. to come to to yeah. like, get myself it's the opposite of the wind so, down. Yeah, you're, like, I gotta like up. take a long shower. I have to drink <laughs> coffee. I like a decent. I take a long time to drive here. Yeah, it's like I drive slow. I'll drive back roads because I gotta like get. <laughs> so when I show it. up, nobody knows the difference. <laughs> That's great. All right, let's get into this. Okay. A lot, a lot of questions. A uh, few came by email, and like we've said, we've we have people asking us this question over the years. So it's something we want to talk about. Okay. I'm gonna in a minute. I'm gonna ask you to define it, but let's hold off in just a second. Can I? People want to know. Can I commit the unpardonable sin? Just go short answer right now, and then we'll get. I'll, I'll, I'll weave into this a little bit. Not if they have come to know Jesus. Okay. If they are an unbeliever, that could be possible, yes. Is it a single moment or action? I don't think so. No, I, 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 I'd say that with caution because, mm-hmm. again, I, I, there's an element of mystery here because it is God who decides right. that you have crossed the line. Right. But I think it is a process for people. It, it is a even with the Pharisees who he said those words to. Mm-hmm. It had been a process mm-hmm. to where he finally was like, "This is what you're doing." Okay. So I don't know, but I think you know. Yeah, I, okay. I don't know is the answer, but I, I don't. I think most of the time it would be a, a process of rejection. Okay. Give us the definition in whatever you can do, one or two sentences, however you want to define that. Yeah, it's hard. <clears throat> it's a little bit difficult, but it is basically. A no, a, a a knowing, willful, full scale rejection of the, an understood gospel. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a accidental negligence mm-hmm. for. I, I, I don't want to say too much; it would go on too long. But like the the guy, uh, the person in the remote Amazon jungle. Right, so that guy's not going to know as much about the Lord. He may God, he may search the stars and pray to whatever's out there. The Lord may send an angel, may send a missionary to reach him. Yeah, but if if that does not, if he does not repent with the limited revelation that he has, that guy is not necessarily committing the unpardonable sin in the same way. Where you, with a full knowledge, full conviction, full understanding, I, you you say, "I understand," and I openly reject. reject. I treat this as yeah. unholy. So that is good news in the sense that I know there are people that are walking around going, oh, I, I cussed today, I you know, swore yeah. at my neighbor, and yeah. I feel bad about it, I shouldn't have done it, right. I did this. Like We all go through days where we regret things, mm-hmm. where we mess up, where we sin. So none of those things are, just a reminder people, that that's not the unpardonable sin where you're like, oh man, I probably shouldn't have Absolutely said that. Absolutely not. It's not taking the Lord's name in vain. In fact, he said all blasphemies right. will be forgiven men. Right. Right. Except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, so it's not a swear word or a moment. It's not even murder. Mm-hmm. Like it's not. Mm-hmm. It's it's not a specific like, oh, you committed this once and you broke this commandment. You know. Okay. So you talked about some of those, some of those other sins. You know, murder or suicide, rape. You can talk about some of the things yeah. that we we would consider, you know, some of the most heinous sins out there. In Hebrews uh, ten, it talks about this. There was a single offering from Christ that takes away that. Yeah. So we, we would say in our wording, which is which is true, you know, people would say, you know, I've done this, and we would say, was Christ's sacrifice not enough for those sins? And we say, you know, of course it was enough. They think, right. well, I did this, Christ's sacrifice was enough. What makes this one different than any of those things that we like to define as the most wicked sin? Yeah, very good question. 
so you are rejecting the sacrifice itself. That's mm. what it is. You're yeah. rejecting the only means of salvation. Mm-hmm. That is the only unpardonable thing. And I don't, again, I don't just mean rejecting out of ignorance or negligence or whatever. You you understood it. You were enlightened, so mm-hmm. it is said. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you know you were the rich young ruler was he? I think he did it. He was drawn to the Lord. He understood. He was it was explained to him by Jesus Himself, and he turned against it and walked away. Yeah. Jesus died for all his sins, but the very dying of Jesus is what you reject. Is what you reject. Then. You yeah, reject the means of your salvation. Yeah. Okay. Really good. Okay, I want to talk about two passages that were a part of your sermon um, and some questions that came out of that specifically. Mark 3, okay. this is the words of Jesus, uh, not not necessarily the drive of the sermon, but it's in there. And he says, uh, and if a house divided mm-hmm. against itself, that house will not be able to stand. We had a question okay. uh, asked, a believer and a non-believer in a, in a, in a marriage. That, that might be considered a house that is not able to stand. It does. The question is, does the, the one that believes, do they have a place in heaven? The part, be- part A. The believer? The believer. They do, yes. Yes. Explain a little bit why that is true in the unity of marriage, I guess. Right. Well, because salvation uh, is, is, only to, is only dealt with, with the individual soul. Mm-hmm. Marriage... Um, you know, being affiliated with somebody, being married to somebody, having, you know, again, the classic believing grandmother that prayed or mm-hmm. the dad who was a pastor, it means nothing for means your nothing, salvation. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. In fact, Jesus dealt with this in a parable in Matthew, uh, as we're talking about this, I think 25, when he talked, when yeah, the parable of the ten virgins, when the bridegroom comes and they try to, they try to borrow oil. Mm-hmm. So oil is is symbolic of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for mm-hmm. salvation, and when the judgment comes and the door is closed, they had gone away to buy. They 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 say, "Give us some of your oil so we can keep our lamps lit," which means it's to, it's a picture of salvation. And he says, "No, everyone has to have their own oil, basically. Mm-hmm. And some go away mm-hmm. to buy oil. The bridegroom comes, the door shuts, and they're on the outside." Um, that that would be the same in marriage. Like yeah. you can't borrow salvation yeah. from your spouse. Yeah. Nor can it be taken from the unbeliever. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you put it that way, and I never thought about it outside with, with the question being in marriage. That is totally true that we, I say we, people in general like to borrow my, my grandmother's yeah. religion or I grew up in this type of church when that decision was never made for yourself. You're, right. you're borrow, trying to borrow. And you see that the, the Jews tried to do that like with their heritage Sons too. of Abraham. Abraham, Hey, we're, right? hey, we're yeah. sons of Abraham. What else you want? Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Okay, the second part of that then, what would be the implication for a marriage in that context of the house divided cannot stand what what would that mean well the house divided the, the, the cannot stand is a is a metaphor it's a it's a parable it's mm-hmm. a it's an allegory all these words it could be applied to that mm-hmm. and it won't stand meaning um there will not be spiritual unity it yeah. will not the, the marriage will not seek the lord to its full potential yeah you are unequally yoked together, the Bible says, and that is a very difficult scenario. It is not impossible. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7 forbids the believer to put the unbeliever away in divorce if they are willing to live with you. Mm-hmm. And, and the Bible says, and who knows, maybe th- basically, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. through your faithfulness, yeah. maybe, and we've seen this many times, we have, yeah. maybe through your faithfulness and your godliness, that person will come to know the Lord and what was unequal now becomes equal. It is no longer divided and it becomes unified before the Lord. It's a great story. So don't quit on your marriage. Don't give up right. hope. Right. You are unequally yoked. I imagine it's difficult. There is an element where you are divided. But when Jesus told that parable in Mark, he was not talking about marriage. He was talking about spiritual realities. So it is a little bit different, right, though right. It, it is not out of bounds to say we are divided spiritually, and that is difficult. The believer's job, if the unbeliever is willing to stay, is to be the most godly spouse you can be and show Christ to them. That's good. And you need a miracle, yes. And that happens every day, and it would be great if it did. That's good. Um I think you're. I don't know if you mentioned the passage or not, but First Peter three I talks a little bit talks a little bit about this too. If if you're out there wondering, can I get some more scripture on that? Of you know maybe what that would look like on a <clears throat> on a day to day thing. So I just wanted to mention that. 
So the next yeah. passage that is, <coughs> I would say maybe to my knowledge, the biggest component for those that believe you can lose your salvation, Hebrews it's chapter huge. six. It's huge, yeah. The one that is used the most. And I know we've talked a little bit about in the last, I don't know, often about eternal, whatever you'd call it, eternal security, loss of salvation. It's a fair question. It's fair mm-hmm. to know, can I lose my salvation? So the ones that believe this would use Hebrews 6. We're going to come flat out and say, we don't believe in any way that you can lose your salvation. But here's what Hebrews 6 is, verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of age to come, then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Let's talk about that a little bit. How is that not losing your salvation? What would that be referring yeah, to? Yeah, and I and I do it, again. You said it's very controversial, mm-hmm. um, and I I fully understand why people say what they say about it with yeah. regard to loss of salvation. Yeah, I think you have to take the whole counsel of God when yeah. you consider this. Um, there are others that equally come as strong. For being unable, you know, for being secure in your eternity, right. being born again, right. receiving the adoption as son. So, what does he, you know, unadopt us? Are we, yeah. you know, uh, you're unborn again, or yeah, the you know, seal of the seal of the Holy the seal, Spirit. You're unsealed. Yeah. You know, nobody but the King can break the seal, but you can. Right. Like, what, what does that mean? Right. You know, there's a lot of implications, and that we've talked about before. So, but I do see why isolating this would be like, well, they were saved and then they're not, or it is those who are enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. It does not say it necessarily indwell. Doesn't mm-hmm. That doesn't mean they are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And have tasted the good word of God in the powers of the age to come and fallen away from it. Again, the classic example, the best example in the Bible, I think, is Judas. Judas is not and was never a Christian, mm-hmm. as accounted in the Bible. But he, all of those things, he was enlightened to who Jesus was. He tasted of the heavenly gift. He was there. He saw the miracles. He he put his hands yeah. on the miracles. Yeah, meaning he he easily was a partaker of the Holy Spirit. He saw the work of the Holy Spirit. He saw the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of the saving power of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. tasted the good word of God from the mouth of Jesus, even speaking the truth and the powers of the age to come. He saw the resurrection of the dead. He saw it and he turned away from it. So rather than it is it is a consideration for people. Rather than say this is a saved person lost, is it possible that an unbeliever can get that close to the door, look in, and turn away from it? Mm-hmm. That seems to be coupled with Hebrews 10, which you'll probably talk about maybe. But, yeah, going to next, yeah. Uh, that seems to be the case. And then in verse 8 it says, meaning a person rejecting all of that, if it yields thorns and thistles, it ends up being burned. That's clearly a judgment. Mm-hmm. Um so that's how we take it. That's how we preach it. Uh, we couple it with a lot of other scriptures. Many I cut out, in fact, but mm-hmm. um, it seems to be an, a person enlightened that hardens over. That's why there's the warning. My whole sermon. I mean, that's why there's the warning. Well, yeah. If you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Yeah. Well, if you hear His voice, then you have been a partaker of the Holy Spirit. You mm-hmm. heard the you. You don't enlighten yourself. You don't awaken yourself to the need for salvation. The Holy right. Spirit does that. Right. So you partake in God into that. At that, that far, I guess. Yeah. But then yeah. you turn away. Yeah. It's impossible to renew you again to repentance. It's it's over. Okay, let's let's go into Hebrews uh, ten then. So verse twenty six says, "So if we go on sinning deliberately, mm-hmm. after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Mm-hmm. If we go on sinning, who's we, and what what does sinning deliberate mean? Because I, I would. I would say that at some point, since you have known the Lord, you have sinned deliberately. I could admit that I've done that. You know, you you're just moment of lapse, or even in straight rebellion. I don't care. Did does that mean I never knew the Lord? What is that referring to there? Right. So, it, it, at first in verse nineteen, it says, "Therefore, brethren," it's talking about our confidence as believers. Okay. Then it talks about the not forsaking our assembling together. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
as believers. Then the very next verse, if we go on sinning willfully. So then what happens is he seems to reveal that there are those among us Mm -hmm. that believe that they are a part of the body of Christ, but yet there is this other fruit that would indicate they are in fact fraudulent. This is the, again, this is evident from old, from Genesis. This is Cain in the family of Abel. Cain Mm -hmm. offered a sacrifice to the Lord, but the Lord rejected it, Mm -hmm. meaning he participated in worship. He demonstrated uh, an outward evidence of the fear of God, Mm -hmm. but it was revealed later that he did not actually have it. Mm -hmm. Jesus told the parable of the the wheat and the tares. The tares come among the wheat. The disciples say, do you want us to uproot them? He says, no, wait until the judgment, and God will separate the fraud from the real. These are people among the body of Christ, talking like Christians, acting like Christians in the church. Yet, they go on sitting willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. They, in verse 29, they trample underfoot the Son of God by their conduct, by their hard heart, by their love of sin. They regard as unclean the blood of the covenant. They insult or blaspheme the Spirit of grace, and it says that vengeance is mine. They are under judgment. They're not believers, It's but they are among believers. Mm. Again, I, I cut this verse. I'll just say it. First John 2.19 says they went out from us, but they were, we're not. not of us. No. Judas yet again. Yeah. So there is this case. This is not a. If you were to take this passage, just pull it and be like, "This is talking about fake people in the church." There's nothing else in the Bible right, about that. It'd right. be like, "Wait a minute, maybe it says something else." Right. This is pounded to death that there are frauds among the authentic, saved people in the Lord, Old and New Testament, mm-hmm. and the Bible warns and warns and warns and chastises that and gives the evidence and fruit of that over and over. Hmm. Okay, the there was a, a passage in there you would read that said it'll be more tolerable for yeah. um, some wicked cities, Tyre and Sidon. Yep. I think Sodom was mentioned in there yep. too. Yep. It'll be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than basically these type of people, right, that are around yes. and enlightened, uh, the Judas type, where they, they saw it, they were partakers, yep. but rejected. I can't help but think hell is... Literally the worst place we can think of. Are there? Are there? Is there a worse version of that? What would a what would a worse judgment look like? A different judgment for those type of people? Yeah, I, I don't know, um, but yes is the answer. Yeah. There, there, there's a there seems to be again in a multitude of passages yeah. a worse hell for some than others. Yeah. So he says he be, in Matthew 11 he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because mm. they did not repent mm-hmm. and then he says of them it will be more tolerable in verse 24 for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you mm-hmm. it's so clear why because they had more evidence they had more revelation not everybody that ever lives and dies has equal understanding of who god is and what the gospel is it's not all equal and the ones who have the most are most accountable and they've and if they reject it they will be most judged harshly Mm. that jesus is the only one who taught that there would be well i don't know if he's the only one but he is the one that seems to have the wide body of preaching mm-hmm. on there is a severe punishment. He talks about the parable of the servant who went out and knew his master's will and did not do it. He gets beaten with more lashes than the guy who was ignorant to what his master's will was. Mm-hmm. Both are unbelievers. Both are punished. One is punished worse because you knew better. Mm. You know. Yeah. Okay. The um, the door shutting per se. Dude, I don't know if we have time for this now, but that story <laughs> of you in Haiti, yeah, I've, I've, I don't know if I've ever heard anything as crazy as that. So if you didn't hear the sermon, you can go back and listen to that, the sermon on the unpardonable sin. I, yeah. Do you, do you think, do you think for them, like if you hadn't had that moment, do you think those, those voodoo priests would have passed? I think maybe not. Yeah, that, that's that's a, I think, that's a crazy I think, story. I think maybe not. It, it, you know, and in, in me and you, we come from a we come from a preaching background when we were kids, where people would tell dramatic mm-hmm. second and third hand stories designed to manipulate maybe fear or a yes, reaction into a choice, yeah, to yeah. make a decision for Jesus. And looking back. And then over the years, we we there's one in, in particular we don't need to tell it right now, but 
one story where you and I didn't even grow up together have heard the exact same story mm-hmm. that I think is probably myth and legend. Mm-hmm. It's just a it's just an old fire and brimstone fakery, you know. Mm-hmm. So I don't like doing that unless right. I was there. You were there, yeah. And in many cases, yeah. had witnesses there with me that can attest to what happened. And in, and in preferably sitting in the very crowd last Sunday that mm-hmm. I'm preaching to to verify he's not telling some nonsensical story. I right. was there and I saw it happen. Right. That is what that story is. Yeah. There are people that are sitting at the rock on Sunday that were standing right with me. We met those guys. There's a lot I left out, but right. in, the gist was... Man, they were convicted. Like the one guy rejected in anger, and the one guy just rejected for self preservation or whatever. Mm-hmm. But he was ruined in his heart. He was convicted to the point I said, Man, do you need help yeah. to call out to Jesus? And he yeah. said, No, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And then two weeks later, they were dead. I asked the cause of death. I was like, What did they die of? And he said, They both went to bed and then they didn't wake up. They were laying in bed dead. That's so bizarre. It's insane and i do believe it is quite possible i can't say for sure right that would not have happened like that that was the last stop god in his mercy and his grace gave them whatever they have been searching for their entire life Mm. one more crystal clear time they rejected to its face and paid the price for it Mm. the haitians knew it too he said that's crazy satan is what they died of wow They, they gave themselves over Wow. All right. I want to uh, end with one takeaway. So a lot of times when we're looking at the unpardonable sin, we always want to ask the question, well, who, who is this? Or could I, could I do this? But I, I want to make sure that the point is not lost. What is, what is the point for those that are listening to the message to Good. say that are asking all these questions? What's the main takeaway they need? The, the, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you know the Lord? Do you really know the Lord? And if so, follow him faithfully. You're not going to lose your salvation, but follow him faithfully and tell lost people the truth. If you don't know the Lord and you are moved even right now, Mm -hmm. respond to the Lord by faith. Call out to Jesus to be saved. Because if you assume that you'll still have the same feeling you have right now tomorrow and the same opportunity, you may not. And you may never have it again. Yeah. No reason to delay whatsoever. So. No, ever. All right. Hopefully this helped answer some questions, and I know there's so much more. We always want to welcome uh, – you guys can email us anytime for questions that we want to hit up on the Encore or even even more about this. If you just want us to answer those in email, we'd be happy to do that. Encore at Rockfenton. Dot com. I'm 90% sure that was right. It is right. <laughs> All right. And uh, as always, don't take our word for it being his this week, and we'll see you next time on the Encore.